I just wanted to share a little bit on uh, overcoming sin. And I'm reading now from the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 17. I'm reading again, overcoming sin, and he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. So this is what I wanted to focus on today. And uh, I also want to celebrate and acknowledge the fact that uh, for us to be living in the midst of a coastal sea where the big decay globally, moral brokenness, moral decay, sin has uh, deluged, has inundated this world, flooded the world, and then at this time, sin has also entered the church, the inner chambers of the house of the Lord. And I want to celebrate the fact that at this critical hour of decay and darkness, to even have a sermon like this is celebratory. This is celebratable. To have a sermon that is entitled, the heading says, Overcoming Sin. I think that is a big thing. But that's a big list. It's a big achievement in the church. Because right now the church, as we know, is involved in a different agenda. But from a place where you are being taught, and the title is Overcoming Sin and the Treasures Thereat, or Therein. But that's a big thing. I don't want you to take it for granted, beloved people, wherever you are in all nations. But, you know, we have to be awake to the granules, to the graves, to the, to the texture of this move of God. We have to be alive to the nitty-gritty, the inner details, the inner workings of this revival. And this is one of them. The fact that at this hour we can be able to have a tremendous discourse on overcoming sin. To begin to exalt, to exalt also, to exalt the church, the believer, on endeavoring that they overcome sin. That's very powerful at a time when the other church is doing other things and involved in different agendas, pursuing the world, and they're in everything else under that, all the time. So um, that's why at this time, I wanted, as we share on this, that we appreciate the Lord, that uh, this breeze and breath of awakening that is sweeping across the church is much welcome, is appreciated, and then we will use it sparingly and jealously guide it. That's all I'm saying here. And that's why it would be so celebrated that at this time we can engage on this very important subject of overcoming sin. And again, I want to begin by focusing on uh, this Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he says, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. This is very powerful. It is as though now, very clearly here, we see God beginning to reveal the secret of eternity. In this scripture, you see very clearly that God is beginning now to open the, in this scripture to reveal the secrets of eternal life. The hidden thing about eternity, the things that, uh, you know, nobody thought about, you know, pursuing, you know, they are hidden things, things that are hidden. And then you see at this place, he's talking about the things that are hidden, the things of eternity, the things of eternal life. And so this is a very powerful thing that the Lord comes out openly now to talk about eternal life and the hidden secrets of eternity. But first of all, before we delve deeper and uh, 
go into the thick of it on Revelation 2, 17. Why don't we look at the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, and develop a comparative understanding on what could the Lord be talking about in this way and to the church at this hour in the history of humanity and the earth. So we see again here the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, Let's see what he says here. He says, But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So I think right away you begin to understand what the Lord implied in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 17. Because in chapter 2, verse 17, he says, He that overcomes, verse 17, I'm reading here, the book of Revelation 2, 17, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then he says, Him who overcomes, I'll give some of the hidden manna, and I'll give him a white stone, with a new name written on it, and a name only known to he that receives it. So this overcoming that the Lord is emphasizing in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 17, we develop a great understanding when we get back to Genesis, chapter 2, verse 17. Because in Genesis 2, 17, we see the way the formation is set up there. There is a construct that has been built out there. You see that the Lord has created the beautiful paradise, the garden, and in the garden he has set out the tree of life where it's positioned and the way that leads to the tree of life. The way that leads to the tree of life. There is a path, a way that leads to the tree of life. And then we also see the caution that is given to man when he creates man, he puts man in there. He puts in there the tree of life, he puts in another tree, there, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then he knows that the enemy is in the area, is in the neighborhood. Because, you know, the enemy was flushed down, when you see the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 7, he was flushed down, and with one third of the angels, he fell down, he was flushed like lightning towards the earth. But the Lord was very much aware when he did the formation, whereby now you have the garden of paradise. And in that garden, the Ark of the Covenant is. Why? Because there are two cherubim of glory there, and God the Father is. But when you look at the demarcation, then you understand that God the Father is on the side where the tree of life is, as we all do know. That is where eternity is, of course. And uh, the cherubim of glory are the ones that flank both sides of the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. So we know that in the garden, the Ark of the Covenant was. And so that is the structure, that is the formation, the configuration that was set up in the garden, that you see the domain of the tree of life, the path that leads the tree of life. Then you see the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then Adam and Eve have been created here, and the serpent is in the neighborhood. In that formation, in that construct, then you hear now the Lord cautioning and saying, Please do not touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day that thou touchest or thou eatest, if you eat from that tree, you will for sure die. So that brings home a very powerful understanding on the entire conversation of the thesis, the thesis that the Lord submits in the book of Revelation chapter 2 verse 17 which says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says, the churches. And he says, to him who overcomes, I'll give some of the hidden manna, and I'll also give him a white stone, with a name written on it, known only to him who receives it. This is very powerful, because you see the Lord revealing the secret of eternity. And I say, for you to understand what he implies, the magnitude, 
the gravity and the dynamic of the overcoming. What he implied by overcoming, you would have to look at the construction, the formation that takes place in Genesis 2, verse 17, where all things have been set and the serpent is in the area, the tempter. Then he says, whosoever overcomes the temptations of the devil there is the one he is talking about in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, beloved people. Let me repeat this. He says that there is a blueprint of creation that has been set up, has been constructed, a construct built down there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. And you have the tree of life, the powerful tree of life. And we know that that is where eternity is. And that is where God the Father is. That's why you see the two Kerubi of glory are. That's why you see them there. But he says that there is a path, there is a way that was constructed by the Lord that whosoever overcome in the garden, and by overcoming that, he meant what? He meant, do not touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, I know that the serpent will come and lie to you and try to lie to you because he is in the neighborhood. But if you will be able to overcome his deception. If you will be able to reject him, then he says, now you are the overcome, as he talks about in the book of Revelation 2.17. Again, in the garden down there, the serpent is in the neighborhood. The tree of life is over there. You only need to make a one-step bottleneck, a one-step of voluntary obedience, and then the rest is the eternity, because there is a way that now guides you into the tree of life where God the Father himself is, into the vicinity of the tree of life, access, access to God, meeting God face to face. And so, this is very powerful, because now we are beginning to understand whom he refers to as overcomers. Because he's essentially addressing a select people, an elect, a special people inside heaven. These are the secrets of heaven, Revelation 2.17. He is now releasing the secrets of the eternity. He is now um, divulging some of the hidden secrets of everlasting life, of heaven. And in doing so, you see very much that now we are privy of some of the inner workings of eternal life, of eternity. We're beginning to understand the events as they will accrue in the eternal kingdom of God Almighty. Because he says, to he that will overcome, to him who overcomes. Now, he's already using Genesis 2, verse 17, to define who those are, those overcomers are. But you know the tragedy that took place in the garden? And I've said repeatedly over time, again and again, that when Christ Jesus the Messiah came, he defeated Satan, he defeated the devil on the cross. And that was powerfully prophesied across the entire Bible that he would come. He would come, the greater son of David, he would come and he would dismatch the serpent. He would destroy the serpent. He would actually disarm the serpent. He would overcome him. He would defeat him. And that's why Christ Jesus, the Messiah himself, when he finished it all, he said, it is finished, and said, I have overcome the world. But he, the overcomer, would come. And once he would defeat Satan, he would then give a new way. He would give a new bridge, a new approach a new way of man, fallen man that fell in the garden to access the Lord, to access God the Son. And I thought that was very powerful because that then was the hope that came, the light that came into the dark world. However, we know it too well, and you know it too, that even over time as Christ the Messiah finished his public ministry here on the earth and ascended seated on the right hand side of God the Father, the throne of power in heaven. We all know it too well that ever since then apostasy has consumed the church. Oh, 
in the process of apostasy, what do we see? The enemy has repeated the events you see in Genesis 2.17. And that's why the import of that is the relevance we are emphasizing in Revelation chapter 2.17. That again, even with the Calvary cross, now the enemy has come to church again and lied to the church that, again, look, you can get away with disobeying God and still earn eternal life. And that is not true, but that is the lie of Satan. So again, that same question becomes very important in this generation. Because the Lord is again saying to this generation that whosoever will overcome the enemy with his whim and with all his delusions and the lies and the deception he's using to lie to this entire world, whosoever overcomes in this dispensation of the cross, again now he speaks to them, Revelation 2.17, he says, those overcomers, to them, you give some hidden manner in the kingdom of God, and then a white stone on which their names will be engraved, only known to they that receive. And I thought that was a very important aspect of this entire conversation on overcoming sin, that I should be able to, to open up, to focus on, to engage you on, beloved people. And so, just stepwise, you know, I know there's a whole story on this, but stepwise, can we try to develop an understanding of this? The book of Philippians, if you turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, what is he talking about in Revelation chapter 2 verse 17? Philippians chapter 3, the book of Philippians chapter 3, and uh, Revelation chapter 2. 22, verse 12, and then uh, we will also navigate to Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, and then we'll go to Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, and then in this introduction, I will also navigate you to um, Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. And then we'll navigate also to Revelation, chapter 2, verse 7. Let me go through those scriptures again for introduction. We'll look at Philippians, chapter 3. We could read the entire. And then uh, we will also look at the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 12. We could read down up to 14 but we'll focus on 12. And also, Revelation chapter 3, you could read the majority, but we'll focus on verse 12. And then I'll conclude with Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. That will set up the conversation. That will open up a very good preamble for us that we may understand the conversation the Lord is relaying to the church at this hour. Again, regarding Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, regarding this unveiling, this revealing that you see God all of a sudden is revealing the secrets of eternity. And I'm starting with Revelation 22, 14. Again, I said Philippians chapter 3 as a whole. It's a short chapter. You, can, you could read all. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, probably up to 14. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. And then we'll terminate Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 to set a stage for our conversation today. What does the Lord mean? And there are so many symbols he has put in place when you look at the book of Revelation chapter 2 verse 17. He talks about number one overcomers and I've now tried to define for you those people in the context of the New Testament after the cross that there is a delusion, there is another lie on going in church where the devil is now lying to the Christians and saying no, you can still disobey God and see eternity. That's why you see that the church continues in sin inside the house. And though they are blind to the ordinances and the benchmarks of God for entry into eternity. So that is a lie. So you see the repeat of Genesis 2, verse 17, in the house today. So 
So one of the main uh, elements in that scripture of Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, is the deception that was in the garden, and the deception that accrues at this hour. Those who overcome, those who were destined to overcome in the garden, the caution of God, when he says, don't touch that tree, and those who overcome at this hour. And then you also now see after defining the overcomers then, then you also see that there is hidden manner. What is this hidden manner? Those are now the inner secrets. He says hidden, concealed, but he's opening it up now, that there is a hidden manner. There is some hidden manner that uh, those who are his elect feed on, will feed on. Then he talks about a white stone, a white stone that will be handed over. There will be a ceremony where uh, the, the white stone will be handed over to certain people. And he really brings them out as a special elect. And then he talks about a new name. But again, to set the stage for this conversation, there is Philippians chapter 3. I've chosen to begin with Revelation 22, 12. Revelation 22, 12, he says, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. And of course, down there, verse 13, he goes on to say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And he goes on further, verse 14, he says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. And that, that is very powerful, beloved people, in the context of our conversation today. I've chosen to begin with Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Why? Because it speaks the same thing as the book of Philippians chapter 3, the main item you see being exalted in chapter 3. And in Philippians chapter 3, he is simply saying that there is a race. There is a race that you are supposed to run. There is a race going on, beloved people, and that the first prize, that uh, the people should run the race of Christianity, hmm? run the race to press on. You should press on. It says you press on until you get the first prize. You see? And so this is the entire conversation we're talking about. So I've decided instead to read from Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 22, and verse 12. And I've said that is essentially the same principle the Lord is laying out in Philippians. And here in Revelation 22, verse 12, he says, Behold, I am coming soon. And you see, as he comes to the clouds, he says, my reward is with me. In his hand, he's holding the reward. And he's the, the reward that he will give to everyone according to what they have done. So this is the entire essence of our conversation here, beloved people. And I'm bringing in this Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, in the context of Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, so that we may go deeper in defining who are these overcomers that God the Father Yahweh celebrates. He distinguishes them from the rest of all the people that sent us heaven, and then he celebrates them. And then he talks about an award ceremony when they will be handed the fresh manna, the hidden manna which is concealed, and then after being handed the hidden manna, he also gives them a white stone. And Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, is going to be important in terms of their contrast. And it's going to be such a gruesome contrast. Again, I'll talk about Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, and then we'll go to chapter 2, verse 7, is the contrast. But again, Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, now says here, Him who overcome, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. 
I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down from heaven from my God. And I'll also write on him my new name. So there's so much in there, beloved people, regarding the conversation we're having about the identity of those that overcome that God the Father is raising in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. He's saying, here he's raising, he's opening up more things. He's saying, the name of God, the name of the city, and the new name of Christ. So, certain hidden names in eternity. There are certain names that uh, the church does not know now, the names of God. For example, the Messiah says, I'll write on him my new name, meaning there is a new name that the church is not even aware of at this time. But he's now opening it up here, that when that hour comes to this elect, that name will appertain. And I want to go step by step, because there are many issues I want to open up here. I don't want to jump into the name, but I just brought that up so that you may understand that we have a big conversation in our hands. He talk about the name of his God, the pillar in the temple, and so forth. So, I will come to the stone, but it's important we understand that this is the revealing of the hidden secret of heaven, what the Lord did here. And when you see the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 7, he says, He was an ear letting hear what the Spirit says the churches. To him overcome, I'll give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in paradise, the paradise of the Lord. There you go now. So we are beginning to understand what the hidden manna will also be. But if you read the book of Hebrews, it says, at one point it says that Christ is exalted above the higher heaven. And that has also raised a lot of conversation within the church. Because while in Philippians chapter 3 it talks about pressing on until you get the first prize, then in Revelation 22 verse 12 on we have seen that he comes with a reward and not everyone gets the same reward. Because he gives to everyone according to what they have done. So that is the point at which I want us to engage in this conversation to define the overcomer. Because he's saying that while all will come into heaven, but when it comes to giving the prize, uh, appreciating how you executed your Christian salvation, then he says not everyone will get the same prize. And that's why you see in Revelation chapter verse 17, which is our reference scripture, the Lord comes out so boldly and powerfully to make you understand that there is going to be an elect. And that elect, he calls them the overcomers. And we're going to dig deeper today on this matter. And as they come into the kingdom of glory, he says, right away upon their arrival, a moment comes when you give them the hidden manna. And we need hands to understand who these overcomers are, these elect. Is it the entire church that enters heaven? The answer is absolutely no. There is a select people, and he even says to them that you give them hidden manna to feed them, and then he says, I'll give them a white stone, and on that stone it's amazing. On that stone, you hear that a name will be written their name. And he says, that name, not all people in heaven will be able to read that name. <laughs> this is amazing, beloved. Let me read it for you again. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord says to the church. To him who overcomes, I'll give some of the hidden manna, hidden, concealed manna, hidden by the hidden counsel of God, 
hidden by the hidden wisdom of God, hidden manner, and I'll give him a white stone with a name written on it, known only to him who overcome, to him who receives, who receives the stone, meaning the script that will be used there, no one else can understand it. All the other people in heaven will not be able to read it. Only the one that received that stone will be able to read it. So this is a very big time, beloved people, in the history of the church, that now we can open up this understanding that there will be some structure in the kingdom of heaven. And I say it, and that's why you see in the book of Philippians chapter 3, we talk about the first Christ. And in Revelation 22, verse 12, it talks about the reward in his hand, and you give to each one according to what they have done. If there is any moment of accountability in Christian salvation on what your thought schemes were, what the contemplations of your heart were, and what your deeds were, even as you were born again, then this is it. This is now what should draw every Christian to serious accountability, because everything will be accounted for. And then, beloved people, having discussed that, then I want us to look at now the white stone then. I want us to open a conversation on the white stone, since we have laid now a good platform to discuss this by reading Revelation 22, 12, Revelation 3, 12, and Revelation 2, 7. And I say there's so much in there, as in even the hidden matter and so forth. But can we begin with the white stone then. We know too well that uh, white always symbolizes purity and righteousness. And so, the giving of the white stone, what does it signify then? What will it signify? How can we use this scripture of Revelation chapter 217 and the reward, the benefits you see accruing to those who have been faithful? Overcomers, meaning those who live an active life. I'm talking about a combatant, combatant, a combatant church, a combatant Christian, a militant Christian who says, I'm out to fight Satan. I'm going to fight sin and fight Satan and fight deception and fight decay. So, what then are the benefits? And then he says, the white stone. I'm talking about those that step out to fight sin in this time. So how can we use this scripture to encourage the present-day church to shun sin, reject sin, and fight sin? Because we know the coming of the Messiah is near. But now we have impetus here. We have an encouragement here that if you will persevere, you will make it. And I'm glad that this conversation is being brought at a time when there is a whole backdrop around the church of wickedness, persecution, many trials, and all things that you need to prevail over. That the whole world right now has turned against Christian salvation. So, how can we use this? How can we use this at this hour to encourage every Christian believer to hearken unto a combat against sin, to develop a stance, a positioning of battling sin, rejecting sin, and overcoming sin. This is the whole premise of this conversation we're having today, that at the end of it all, you may see the greater treasure that will be levied, be laid on those that will have combated sin deliberately, and by the power of the Spirit of the Lord, overcome sin. I mean, those who will be in their lives fighting sin. Say, from today on, I've resolved, I have zero tolerance to sin. And sin, you overcome sin. Because the Bible says in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 7, resist the enemy and he will flee from you. So, yes, victory is nigh. Victory is in the offing. And so here now, let walk stepwise. So the white stone, begin with the white stone. What is the white stone? What does it mean? 
what is the significance of the white stone that you may be able now to pursue, to press on and say, I will live my Christian life until I also receive that reward of the white stone. First and foremost, we know that to receive black stone will be a problem. And I don't think in heaven there is a black stone. But the white stone is powerful because it symbolizes the approval of God over your life. Number two, it symbolizes purity. It symbolizes righteousness. This was this is a Christian that was righteous. We pursued righteousness. It symbolizes holiness. It symbolizes acceptance. Meaning now God has accepted you. Approval by God. Acceptance by God. Endorsement by God. Kudos. It's as though it's saying, thank you, welcome, well done, my good and faithful servant. It's an acclamation by the Lord. It is a commendation. He now commends you. Say, wow, thank you for the great work. Thank you for resisting the devil. Thank you for not listening to the enemy. Thank you for obeying me. It's a laudation. It's like there's an ovation. Or the Lord esteems you. It, it gives you esteem owing to that. The fact that you rejected sin and stood against sin and overcame by the power of the blood and the testimony of your tongue. As though an admiration, because he's now saying this is an elect, a special group. An admiration. People admire you for this now. Wow, you stood against sin. You resisted sin. You overcame sin. It's like the Lord signed approval, an assent by God, an applause, appreciation by the Lord, because it's a token. It's as though heaven now gives a recognition to you, recognizes you for the great work you did on the earth. Look at all these wonderful things awaiting those who will overcome this world and sin. It's like the Lord is saying, this stone is a token of appreciation, admission. You become admitted into a special class, a special faith, a special group, respect, given re regard, reward, and it's a gratitude. I appreciate what you've done. And it presents very clearly a significance to the Christian, to the receiver of the stone. It signifies, look, blamelessness. Now you're blameless. You're innocent. It's an acquittal. The while there was a fall in the garden, but for you, you are now acquitted for the blood of Jesus because of the blood of the Lamb. You were very faithful to the ordinances that described and defined the worship of the blood. And those ordinances, as we have seen all of us very clearly, are in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. And also Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 26 down. For example, I'm reading Hebrews, chapter 6, verses 4 to 6 now, to look at the ordinances, which means the worship order that the Lord set up for the worshiping of the blood. Where he says, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, but six, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because they are lost in crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public shame and public disgrace. So that is the order of the worshipping of the blood. And he's saying, I appreciate you. I approve of you. I accept you. I now endorse you. I give you kudos. I give you acclamation. I give you commendation. This is laudation for you. I give you an ovation here. I esteem you. I admire you. I applaud you. 
I appreciate you. I have recognition of you. I have respect and regard for you. Why? Because you observe this order of worship. And he says, let them worship as what I have shown you in heaven. And I remember when the Lord took me into heaven and showed me the temple of God in heaven. And the white, wonderful building, the white dome that I saw. The white, glorious dome. In other words, saying, sell them down there to worship according to this order, the heavenly order. And then, this is the order of the worshiping of the blood. These are the bounds that were set for the Christian salvation of the grace. So it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gifts, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because they lost their crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public shame, public disgrace. And so you slowly begin to understand this special group of people. These are people who have rejected the apostasy. In the execution of salvation on the earth here, they stood firm. Firm against sin and firm against apostasy and all the schemes of the devil to slide in apostasy into their Christian salvation. And so he's saying that the white stone here signifies you are blameless now. It's an acquittal. Why? Because he says that you lived your life and you did not allow your Christian salvation to be adulterated by sin. And now you're free from sin because he went to the cross. Why would you still be entangled in sin when he went to the cross? But you do not mix your Christian salvation with foreign objects, foreign mixtures, into your holy, pure Christian salvation. Now I give you the white stone then, to symbolize the molding, as you will see in the next uh, few minutes, that uh, the, the, the faithfulness and commitment that you had as a Christian on the earth. You were so faithful to Christ to the extent that you, if you were an accountant that something was coming your way that was not very holy and right, you rejected it. You were so committed to Christ that if you were a lawyer somewhere and something was coming that looked like could cause you to go and lie in court or somewhere, you rejected it. Or you were a doctor and something came your way, or you were a teacher, whatever it is. Because your faithfulness and your commitment to the pursuit of righteousness, for that that you stood, I now give you the white sword to symbolize what the faithfulness you pursued and the commitment you stood with, how they molded your life, like this rock, like this stone, this white, glorious, glimmering, and glittering stone. So there is so much conversation here, beloved people, to symbolize the purity with which you stood, to symbolize the guiltlessness, the innocence that now you enjoyed out of Christ going to the cross, and you decided to live within the bounds of that innocence to restore. You do not adulterate it. You do not make an, make an admixture. Mix it like you see the present church. If you look, the things I'm saying are very heavy and grave. Why? Because in the context of my conversation tonight with the church, if you look at the present day church, then you weep. Then you see that there is a sharp contrast from the definition of the overcomer I'm laying before you today. Because you see that the present day church has actually have, have made an admixture. They have blended the world with their salvation. So they, they don't fall in, into this definition, this definition of the Lord. And that's why I come to you on Saturday evening, East African time, and some other time, according to the other time zone, but to define to you that, look, there is a price, there is a reward for faithfulness. There is an interest, there's an encouragement here for all now to pursue a faithful life, a holy life, a righteous life, and a zero tolerance to sin. Because there is a reward. It matters. He says it does matter. 
He's saying it here that it will matter. It does matter. Even in the book of Daniel chapter 3, before we proceed further, Daniel chapter 3, if you read, uh, chapter 12 rather, Daniel chapter 12, beloved people, if you read uh, verses 3, I think it's going to be verse 3, Daniel, I'm reading Daniel chapter 12, beloved people, Daniel the anti-prophet, chapter 12, here I am now. And you can read from verse 1 on, but I'm reading through it too. The book of Daniel, chapter 12. And this is what it says from verse 2 on. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting content. Then verse 3 is very pertinent to other people. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heaven, and those who lead many into righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So that is a very powerful standard bench for the Lord sets there on eternity. He's essentially saying that there are those who, according to their work, the, the, the general class, according to their work, they will shine like the firmament, like the heaven. But then he distinguishes them from another category that pursues righteousness, that has dealers of righteousness and firm. They stand firm on it. Then it says, for them, like the stars forever and ever. Again, a distinction right there. You are talking about the church that is wise, that walks in the fear of God, in other words. For the fear of God is wisdom. Behold. It is the fear of God that is with us. Then he's distinguishing that church that is wise, the wise virgin, wise that enters heaven, from another church that pursues righteousness, the teachers of righteousness, that is really zealous on righteousness. And we know it too well that for you to be a teacher of righteousness, you cannot teach what you're not living. You cannot. You cannot stand up and begin teaching righteousness when you yourself you are not living righteousness because it will choke you. It will choke you and people will say, look, it has choked you. They will point a finger. So he's talking about the wise church and then he says, there's another class who are those who pursue righteousness. And then in pursuing righteousness for their own lives, they now by example, by their own lives, the example of their Christian living, lifestyle and living, they now become teachers of righteousness to this dark world. He says they will shine brighter than the rest. So again, there you go. You talk about the rewarding system of God, the distinguishing of the elect of God within the kingdom of heaven. And this is the entire premise of our conversation today. But yes, there is reason for this generation to pursue the prize, the top prize. To be zealous on righteousness and holiness and to totally live a life of rejecting sin. To totally reject sin. That is what I'm pursuing with you here. And the white stone, the giving of the white stone also means that the Lord is saying that this class of believers, overcomers in other words, they have overcome the trap that you saw down there in Genesis 2.17. They have overcome, so the Lord describes them in Genesis 2. In Revelation 2.17, they have overcome the trap of Genesis 2.17, so they now become defined in the book of Revelation 2.17. They are like Christ, in other words. When he gives them that stone, he says they are like Christ. Because we've seen in Revelation 3, again, Revelation 3, verse 12, we've seen there very clearly in 2, verse 7, that at one point Christ the Messiah says he will write his name on them. How powerful, beloved people. Now synonymous. Now finally incorporated into the name of Christ that they are the bearers now. We read 2 verse 7 and then we also read 3 verse 12. And 3 verse 12 it says very clearly here if I get it out. It's Revelation chapter 2 verse 12. And it says, 
So him overcome, I will make him overcome, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. Meaning you'll dwell there forever because you become a pillar there. But you know that the temple, the pillars are quite conspicuous in the temple. They stand out. They are almost like the support system of the temple. They tower high. They are very conspicuous and obvious when you enter the temple. And he says, they will never leave it. And they say, I'll write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which will come down from heaven, from my God. And he says, I will also write on him my new name. So this is very powerful. Namely, they will be like Christ. This white stone they are being given is essentially the admission. It actually admits them to a special class. And I'm going to talk about this admission. It admits them to a certain celebration, a ceremony in heaven. It's a favor they get. And this becomes an emblem. And here he says that they are like Christ. They now bear his name, beloved people. So the white stone offered some special privileges to the bearer, to the receiver of this stone then. And it gives him access to some special events in heaven, some special functions, some special favors in heaven. And we know very well that the temple of God in heaven, as I've described to you, when the Lord took me to heaven and showed me his temple, the temple of heaven, of God in heaven, is built with white marble, white. The stones that build the temple are white. God's temple is white. In other words, he's saying that the receiver of this white stone then becomes of the system, becomes enters, enters part of the system, the stones that are used to build the temple, the everlasting temple of God, the eternal temple. It will never be destroyed. That temple is the eternal. Nobody can ever destroy it. So you see now the emblem. What the white stone is emblematical. And that's why he says they will never leave that temple forever. Meaning they become part of the living God. No wonder he says the pillars of that temple. How often? Who would it want to be part of that recognition and endorsement eternal, to the extent that now you stand out as a pillar, an eternal pillar. And I'm going to come back after a short break. We'll take a short five to ten minute break and come back to you because this conversation is very extensive. I don't know how far I can go with you tonight. But I'm going to come back and speak about something very important. The stone that the high priest used to launch, used to decorate on the garment, the stones of the 12 tribes of Israel, such that when he entered the Holy of Holies, then he entered with those stones, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, and he entered now with them into the presence of God. And how that spoke so much about this white stone that will bring you, the receiver of this, into the presence of worship, the presence of God the Father. 